Reinforcement of Endodontically Treated Teeth, a case review. We want to start by thanking our sponsors, Coteen, Oral Arts, Dental Laboratories, and Romero Dental Seminars for making this webinar possible. We also want to direct all our followers and all our uh, all the people that are watching this webinar uh, to, uh, to our YouTube channel. Please don't forget to click on the bell and to subscribe to our channel so that you can have free access to over 118 videos. Our objectives for today's presentation, the first one will be understand the different ways an endodontically treated tooth can be restored. Learn why the biomimetic option is the better option. And highlight the step-by-step -step protocol for the wallpaper technique. So let's review step number one. Ways endodontically treated teeth can be restored. So as you know, uh, there are multiple ways that we can restore endodontically treated teeth. And I would call this this way the traditional way. Uh, our goal here today is not to say that one technique is better than the other. I know that many doctors out there still like to use endod endodontic posts and bond them into the canal, either metal or fiber posts. Um, this is just a review of the technique. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll show you why I prefer the, um, the biomimetic approach. But again, from a, from a clinical standpoint, this is a still valid technique uh, with its, uh, its caveats. Uh, and the main reason is, in my mind, at least, is, uh, you know, the fracture or a catastrophic fracture that can be caused uh, by endodontically treated teeth that have been restored with, uh, with an endopost. So for this particular case, you can see uh, this is one of my old cases. And you can see that I was able to uh, remove the gutta percha from the paddle canal. I was going to just uh, do a conventional crown prep for this tooth. Um, so I went ahead and removed the gutta percha from the canal approximately uh, allowing four to five millimeters of gutta percha to still be sealing that apex of that, that parallel root of this premolar. Once I do that, uh, I normally went ahead and flushed the canal with sodium hypochlorite so that I can eliminate any residue of the gutta percha and cement, make sure that I was able to dry that with paper points. And once I dried, I, 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 I chose to either cement or to bond the post. Uh, when I were when I was using metal posts, and this is again maybe 25, 28 years ago, uh, I would just cement these posts, these posts using um, resin modified uh, glass ionomer cement. Uh, but um, later in my in my later years of my career, I would go ahead and bond these posts, and I would switch from metal posts to fiber posts, and those fiber posts needed to be bonding. Now, as we all know, bonding a post within the canal has its own little uh, um, issues, and, and you know the main one is how do you know that the canal is completely clean? How do you know that you've acid etched and removed all the smear layer from the canal when you're you know 10 or 11 millimeters within a canal? How do you know that you've been able to flush all that acid and to reduce the acidity of the canal once you flush the acid, the phosphoric acid out of the canal so that you can allow then the dual cure resin cement to dual cure properly. So these are a lot of questions that I personally had when I was doing these techniques, when I was using fiber posts and bonding these posts to, to, inside the canals. Now, the other thing that you have to understand is that if you want to go with a more traditional route, you also have to follow the traditional concepts of ferrule effect, uh, you know, having enough tooth structure beyond the gingival margin so that you don't rely only on the post. The post is only there to maintain that core in place. The post is not, should not be there to reinforce the tooth because if you do that, if you don't have any ferrule effect and you're trying to put all the efforts on that post, keeping the core and strengthening the tooth, most likely you will end up with catastrophic uh, failures of this tooth down the road. So, you know, keep those things in mind. If, you, if you're doing traditional dentistry, you have to follow the traditional concepts of restorative dentistry to the T. Uh, but because, you know, when I was looking into all these concepts and, you know, maybe going from a, from a, from a uh, etch and rinse type of resin cement to a self etch um, and self adhesive resin cement within the canal, you know, what was the strength of that connection between the resin cement, the self adhesive resin cement and the canal walls, all those things came into mind, and those are the reasons why, again, I'm not saying that one technique is better than the other. I'm just saying that those are the reasons why I decided to move away from that technique and follow different protocols like I do today. But, uh, uh, you know, once you have that post cemented 
in this particular case, we cemented the post, um, this metal post with resin mo modified glass ionomer. We build the core up, and in this particular case, we build the core up with a composite resin. We prep the tooth, and again, this is a traditional crown prep. You can see that we've removed a considerable amount of enamel around the tooth. In my mind today, this weakens the structure. That's, again, why I try to do more uh, partial coverage restorations today than uh, what I was doing, you know, 25 years ago. Um, so, you know, again, as a dentist, you, you, every day you start, you, you start asking questions based on the results that you're getting, based on the new materials that are coming out, based on the new research that's coming out. And that's how we should, we should keep updated our protocols and updating our procedures in our clinical practice. So again, now I've placed the cord, I remove the cord, I make my impression. Today I would scan this, and then you have your final restoration, and you can go ahead and, and, and deliver that final restoration. Now, that's one way uh, that we would uh, um, restore endodontically to the tooth. Another way of restoring endodontically to the tooth would be a more conservative way, and this is more what I'm doing today. You can see that this tooth had, has, a, has a root canal done. This is a first molar, and you know there was a lot of tooth structure still remaining here. This case is probably, I would say, uh, maybe 15 years old, and and you can see that I have a lot more tooth structure, uh, a solid, healthy tooth structure around this endotreated tooth. There is no reason why I should do a full coverage restoration. So again, I'm just going through that through that sequence of of of, of events. You know, my dentistry uh, moving forward, my dentistry uh, being updated with the materials and with the new techniques. And the, and, and the new research out there, and, and just, just evolving. And we should all go through that process. We should all evolve and try to always do what's best for our patients. So in this particular case, now I have a lot more tooth structure. There is no need for me to uh, eliminate more tooth structure. So all I did here was, once the root canal was completed, I went ahead and I sealed that root canal. And as you can see, I've used a, a, um, a bulk fill, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I've used a dual cure resin cement uh, dual cure resin, uh, core build the material to fill that uh, pulp chamber. And I actually created a little bit of a depression there. So I prepped a little bit of that pulp chamber just to give my restoration a little bit of more stability. And again, this is nothing to do with retention or, or any type of mechanical retention because I'm going to bond this restoration. But with these little no this little notch that you see here on the buckle and this little depression in the pulp chamber that many people call today like an endocrine, what they really do for me is that they allow me a, a, a nice a seating of my restoration. So I know exactly the way the restoration says it. There is no retentive features. You can see they're very small. They're very... Uh, uh, they're not that deep, and they're they're completely uh, divergent walls. So it means again, this is only just guiding the path of insertion of my final restoration. But look at all that beautiful enamel that I've been, I've been able to preserve uh, on the lingual cuffs. These lingual cuffs are are still intact. They're they're very strong. They're very thick. They got a lot of dentin supporting them. You can see that I have enamel all the way down to the distal margin, and I have a lot of enamel on that buccal margin or the buckled finish line that I created for this indirect partial coverage restoration. And again, I want you to compare this to the previous photo, and you can under I think that we can all appreciate and understand what preservation of tooth structure is all about and what benefits I'm going to get out of this. So this is now the final restoration. You can see that this is a lithium disilicate pressed ceramic uh, restoration with a lot of good staining and, 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 and you know, a partial cover re restoration. I have, I have still maintained and protected those lingual cusps because they're non-functional, because they're nice and thick, because they had a lot of denting supporting them. But I am covering the buccal cusp because that's where the function is going to be. I've given this, this tooth, again, its central fossa so that I have good contacts on the mesial marginal and distal marginal ridges. Again, just thinking about, you know, giving this tooth back the function that it needs. And again, if you look at the intaglio surface of the restoration, here's that little notch that I created on the buckle. Again, just to kind of find that, that, that nice um, uh, direction to, for full seating of the restoration. And the same, uh, that divergent uh, preparation that I did on that pulp chamber, you know, kind of calling this what you would call an endocrine, but it's really, again, the reason why I do it is more for full seating of the restoration so that the restoration is not moving left and right. So it's a lot easier for me to sit down, to sit this restoration and find the path of insertion. This is now the final, uh, after the final delivery of the restoration, 
this restoration was bonded to the tooth structure uh, using resin cement. So again, at this time I wasn't using heated composite, but I was using resin cement, you know, with a with a with a um, with a, and with a total edge technique uh, of a prime and bond two bottle system for adhesive, and then the delivery of the restoration using that resin cement. And I want you to look at the beautiful bio integration uh, of this restoration with the actual tooth structure. Uh, this restoration, I followed it up. I think I have a five year follow up photo of this case. And again, you know, I, I normally follow up all my cases because I want to see, you know, how well these cases do. And, 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 and I've been doing this for 29 years and I have cases that are very, very old, but honestly, the most important thing is that because you preserve a lot of tooth structure, that's really what's giving the strength to this restoration. So it's not really about full coverage because you want to reinforce the tooth. It's actually about less coverage so that you have more of the actual tooth structure giving you the strength that you need on the underlying or, or the overlying uh, overlaying I'm sorry of the of the ceramic restoration so these are the, the these are the concepts that we have to look at in today now I'm going to take you a step further I've shown you a case that is probably 20 or 25 years old I've shown you a case that is probably 10 to 15 years old and I'm going to show you a case that is just maybe a year or two years old where where I am you now combining all these concepts that I was using before with fiber reinforcement. And again, what we're doing here is we're just trying to have a very nice and clean substrate. And that's what we're using the carriers detection dye so that we are sure and, and certain that we removed all the decay, that we have a nice and clean substrate. Because this tooth is root canal treated, I don't have to, I, I eliminate all the cavity, all the carries, the carries are the decayed tissue. If this was a vital tooth, I may be a little bit more particular on having a peripheral seal zone free of carries. And maybe I can have a little bit of a stained dentin in the in the center if I'm very close to the pulp chamber. But because this is an endotreated tooth, of course, I want to just go ahead and remove all the caries. I want to have nice and solid dentin, clean dentin, so that I can get the best bonding out of it. And this is what has changed what has changed today for me. You know, I'm I'm using I'm still using my 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 uh, my two bottle adhesive system, but I'm now reinforcing all these teeth, all these endotreated teeth with a fiber. And I'll tell you why. And what I'm using is a polyethylene fiber. This is specifically ribbon fiber. And as you can see, I am literally bonding that on that purple floor um, uh, through a, uh, and I, and I and bond this, this fiber in, a, in what I call a bed of a combination of a little bit of flowable composite and a little bit of a microhybrid composite, adhesive microhybrid composite. And all I do after that is just push with a micro brush and a little bit of adhesive. And I just push that fiber within this bed uh, of, of that mixture of flow and microhybrid uh, composite until the fiber is completely embedded into the resin to the point that you can you can barely see the fiber and once i do that i continue building up my core using a resin composite and i'm going to go into details with this technique but i just want to show you what this looks like and i want you to think about multiple things i want you to think about c factor i want you to think about you know the the the, the bonding surface how much you increase that bonding surface by adding a fiber i want you to think about c factor because i want you to think about how much composite, how much uh, a final uh, or layer composite you're going to use uh, with or without a fiber. Having a fiber, you have that, you know, occupying a space. So you're going to use less composite on top of that. You most likely are going to have, you're going to reduce significantly your C factor because you have less volume. But but again, you're, you're also creating that super bond, uh, um, bond to that substrate because there's a couple of layers before you even place your uh, your polyethylene fiber. Uh, there's already a hybrid layer that you've created there, and there's ways of making that hybrid layer stronger. And I'm going to walk you through that process uh, so that you can understand why this is important and why I would recommend following these newer quote-unquote techniques. As you can see, this is a, a very short uh, uh, a core buildup with a fiber inside, which is going to you know give me what I what, what has been known or published in the literature as a fail-safe zone. You know, if something were to fail here, it would be the crown, but not my core. And if the crown fails, but not my core, I can always restore this tooth again. And I want you to compare this to a more traditional approach where you have a post within that canal. If there would be, if you don't have a rule effect, like in this case, and you have now, a, 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 you know, physical load on top of a crown and something would fracture, most likely it's going to be the root with the post inside. 
because you have that leverage of that post within the root and you've weakened, quote unquote, that root by removing some good aperture and by creating that intimate contact between the post and the, and the, and, and the length uh, of that canal. So here there are no posts. So if something were to fail, it would be on that core. The root will still be there. But because I have a polyethylene fiber and I've created that fail-safe zone, most likely if, some were, if something were to fail here, would be the crown and not the core. So I can always replace a crown and keep that root as, root as the best implant possible for that patient. That is the theory behind these concepts. Okay, so that's why I want to review now option number two or, or, or the case review number two, which is why the biomimetic approach? And you know, and I say why because many people say, well, there's a lot of steps for you to get this biomimetic type of approach going on. And yes, there are. You know, we we were never told when we went into dental school that we were going into into a career that every single clinical procedure that we did was going to be an easy procedure. You know, we know that there's a lot of effort that we have to put in the things that we do today if we want to accomplish ideal results. So, uh, but not only is the clinical steps, but most importantly, the scientific or the or the, or the evidence that we have out there uh, in order for us to support what we're doing. And this is a very nice study, uh, uh, you know, completed by my Sema Belli. And I just want to review this with you. This was published in 2006. And I want to review this, this, this study with you because this is the one that, that, that shows that what we're doing today and the way that we're managing this, if you're very thorough at the way that you bond and you rebuild these teeth that are endotreated, uh, you, you're really going to get good results. And I want you to look at this because these were not only endotreated teeth, but they also have a fracture, that, a, a, a cuss that was fractured off and was reattached. Now, none of the teeth that I'm going to restore, I'm going to reattach a, a fracture. This is more like for the study, but what they were trying to see, they, they, they were trying to prove is, can you get that reattachment of the fracture and not only strengthening of the actual tooth, of the endotreated tooth, but can you strengthen this to the point that that reattach fragment or, 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 or cuss fracture can also withstand occlusal forces. And, you know, a couple of things that you have to know about this study. And, and you know, and one of the things that, they, that we all know is that a rigid, and I'm just going to read directly from one there because I don't want to put any words in, 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 in this study. I want to just go and review it the way that it, that it is published. A rigid bond between resin composite and tooth structure generates contraction stresses at the bonding interface. So we know that. We know that if our bond is not correctly managed, we're going to have a lot of stresses in that area that is the most important one. We don't want to create any stresses there because if we create stresses, we can also create the, uh, uh, um, the attachments. So this means that if you just created a hybrid layer and this hybrid layer is not mature enough, it's not thick enough, and now you're adding subsequent layers of composite and worse, you know, in, in, in today's world when we have bulk fill, you add something, you know, so bad as a bulk fill composite, I just want you to think about the, 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 the polymerization stress that you are putting into these massive bulks of composite, and then this is now transmitted to this weak area, to the weakest area, which is that, that, that bond, that rigid bond that you have uh, in that hybrid layer. So that's what I want you to think about, because there are ways that you can strengthen that hybrid layer. And one of the things, one of the suggested methods for reducing debonding during that polymerization shrinkage is the application of a low viscosity low modulus inter intermediate resin between the bonding agent and the restorative resin. And that's what we call today the resin coating layer. So in other words, once you create that hybrid layer and the best hybrid layer that you can create today is going to be with a two bottle dental adhesive system where you have a primer and a bonding agent completely separated, not the single bottle adhesive, but the two bottle systems. And now after you apply that and you like your you put a very thin layer of uh, low viscosity resin, which is a flowable composite. It can be a filled flowable composite. You can actually use a bulk fill flowable composite, but you don't want to bulk it up. You just want to put one or one and a half millimeters thickness of that bulk fill composite or any filled flowable composite out there in the market. Just put a, a thin coat. And the way that I do it is I apply it with a periodontal probe. So I know that I'm either one millimeter or less. I don't want to have more than that. And I just go ahead and wet the entire surface of the dentin, moving that flowable composite with the periodontal probe, making sure that it covers the entire dentin. And then I like here. And then what happens after that is very important. And that is you have to give this time for it to mature. We know today that in the first five minutes after you like here, 
that resin coating layer is when that bond strength between the dent and the hyperlayer and the resin coating layer is the strongest. That does not happen immediately after you apply it or immediately after you light cure it. If you, can, if you start applying your composite layers, and again, we're thinking about science, we're thinking about making that science come into play with our clinical procedures, and we're thinking that we want to try to accomplish the best clinical outcomes. So that's why you're doing the best effort. You're giving these extra steps. So you allow that layer to mature for four minutes. That's what I do. And in that fourth minute to the five minute, I'm already applying my, my subsequent layer, which in this case is going to be my fiber uh, reinforcement that is going to go in a bed of flowable and microhybrid. So I'm embedding that fiber within a composite, and that's going to bond to that resin coating layer. So I want to make sure that when I light cure that fiber and resin, my bond strength between the dentin and the hyperlayer and the resin coating layer is the strongest possible. And what we know today is that that becomes the strongest possible, you know, hours after the procedure. But in the first five minutes, you get like 90% of that strength already there. So that's why I feel confident that four minutes after I allow, and I literally put a timer in my office for four minutes, and then in that fifth minute, I start placing my fiber. I know that I'm getting the best, I'm bonding that fiber with resin to the strongest hyperlayer possible from a clinical standpoint. Now, the resin reinforcement of composite restorations with fibrous assemblies can change the effective fracture strength of the teeth and may be effective in reattaching the fracture cusp and endodontically treated teeth through the creation of a strong bridge between the fracture cusp and these fibers. And that's what they found in this study. And I want to show you now the groups that they had. And this is group one through six. And group one, and I just wanted you to pay attention to group one, group five, and group six. Group one is an intact tooth, and I want you to look at the amount of strength uh, 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 that, that was, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the amount of load that this tooth was able to take, the intact tooth, which was a 1728, you know, 1728 plus minus two, uh, 274. So that means that this, these teeth were able to take, you know, more than 1,700 newtons square centimeter when they were loaded in the machine. Now, I want you to look at that intact tooth, and I want you to compare it to group five. And what does group five have? Group five has the primate bond in two bottles, plus a resin coating layer, plus the bulk restoration. They, you know, they just use a dual cure resin to bulk fill it. No light curing for four minutes and then light cured, but no fiber. And if you look at the amount, if you look at the, at the, at the load that it was able to take, it went from using no, from having no restoration, so from an under-restored MOD with a fracture cuff that only was able to take 365 newtons all the way up to 1,055. So, you know, almost three times the amount of strength, the amount of load this tooth was able to take. But look at the difference between the no fiber group, group number five, and the same steps, but including the fiber. So almost, almost very close to the intact tooth. So that's how much you can reinforce a tooth by using these fibers, by using the resin coating layer, by using a two-step uh, uh, adhesive system, by allowing that hyper layer to mature. All these steps that I'm telling you, that's what they give you. They increase the fracture resistance of your tooth. And that's why today, even in teeth that are that that many, many of you out there would just go ahead and extract. If the patient is young enough, if the patient is healthy enough, if the tooth has a root canal that is nice and 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 and, uh, and, and doing well with no contamination, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna always give the benefit of the doubt and I'm gonna give it my best to try to restore that tooth back to function. And this is the reason why. So how do you do this from a clinical standpoint? And that's what we're going to review in our, in, in our third step of our case review series, the wallpaper technique. How do you do this? And again, I'm just going to walk you through the process. You can see this tooth had a crown. It had a large crown. The margins were now uh, 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 open. They had secondary decay underneath. You can see this is after removal of the crown. You can see still some decay left on the lingual side that I have to reprep that area. But right now, what I'm looking at is what I'm focused on is they did a root canal on this tooth. The patient came back to me. You can see the size of the axis because they had to retreat this tooth. Look at the size of the, of, of the axis that was completed the first time that this patient had a root canal. You can see that they removed, I mean, a lot of dentin into that, in, in that pulp chamber. 
there's very little thin walls left. So I definitely have to reinforce this tooth. So what am I going to do? I'm going to create my, first, I'm going to create my hyper layer with the two-step adhesive system. After that, I'm going to do my resin coating layer. And after my resin coating layer, I'm going to place my fiber. Now, between the resin coating layer and my fiber placement, there's four minutes. So I, I do my resin coating layer, one millimeter thick or less of a filled, flowable composite. I light cure it, and I allow that to sit there for four minutes. Four minutes later, I'm going to place a bed of a little bit of flowable composite and a heated microhybrid composite, as you are seeing here in the photo. And this is Brilliant Everglow. I use Brilliant Everglow for all these techniques from Coltine. And now I'm going to put on top of that my first fiber. And the fiber that I chose as my first fiber is a four millimeter by four millimeter piece of polyethylene fiber. This is going to cover almost my entire uh, uh, pulp chamber floor. So I'm going to now push this towards that composite increment that is not light cured. And with a micro brush and a little bit of adhesive, I'm going to push that fiber within that composite. And you can see at the bottom, I've been able now to place the, fi the first fiber and I'm going to light cure it. And then I'm going to put four more pieces of fiber in a circumference. And now you can do two and you can do two L shapes, but I decided to do four. And these are two millimeters by four millimeter long uh, uh, polyethylene fibers. And I'm putting one on each wall. You can see there's one on the lingual wall, one on the distal wall, one on the buccal wall, and I'm putting one now on the mesial wall. So now I have a fiber on the purple floor and fiber surrounding all the walls that I'm trying to build. Every wall is going to be reinforced. Every wall is going to have that benefit of the C factor because I have the fiber within, so less composite is going to fit there, less polymerization shrinkage. But at the same time, all these walls are going to be connected through this mesh of polyethylene fibers reinforcing this tooth. And again, you know, when, because I do this all day long, it really doesn't take that much time. Uh, when you do it for the first time, it may take you a little bit longer because, yes, there's a little bit of a learning curve when you're putting these fibers. But once you get the hang of it, it's the easiest thing to do. So once I complete all those four fibers on the wall, you can see that now I have, I have a very nice mesh structure where all these fibers are connected uh, uh, one to the other. And all these four that are in a circumference in the, in, in the walls of the purple chamber are connected to the one that I have on the floor of the purple chamber, all of this to this composite that I'm using that I've placed, flowable and microhybrid that I've placed to just create this wallpaper. That's why this is called the wallpaper technique because I'm literally covering these walls with this wallpaper, which is the fiber reinforcement with this polyethylene fiber. And then after that, I literally just build, I sculpt, and I'm using, in this particular case, I chose to use A4 from Brilliant Everglow. I just literally, one layer at a time, one millimeter to 1.5 millimeters at a time, I just start layering and start covering everything. And you can see all that hyper layer that was surrounded with, uh, that was covered, you know, that, that all that dentin, I'm sorry, that was surrounded by that hybrid layer all over this tooth is now covered with a thin layer of composite. And I don't want to make this a really tall tooth because, again, my goal is to, uh, I don't want to, uh, this is going to be a 100% bonded restoration. I'm not looking at any type of, you know, uh, ferrule effect or height of the walls. This is going to be a bonded restoration. So I'm going to go around and you can see that I prep a small chamfer just around making sure that I. You know, I, I can have some enamel that it's free, but all my dentin, I want it to be covered by the resin composite, either the composite or the hyper layer. I want to make sure that I allow that hyper layer to mature those 15 days before I get my final restoration back. In this particular case, I went ahead and I placed my cord same day and I went ahead and scanned my preparation. And once I get my restoration back, this is 15 days later. I'm going to clean that tooth with, uh, with aqua care, making sure that I have everything nice and clean. And after that, I'm going to acid edge, prime and bond. And before I cure my prime and bond, I'm going to warm some composite up. And I normally use, again, A4 shade from Brilliant Everglow, warmed. And I'm going to put it in the integral surface of my restoration. You can see that that warmed composite is, is, is thick. So it covers all the areas. It's very, very easy to clean. It needs to be completely light cured. And that is now my final restoration delivered, uh, uh, bonded on top of that fiber reinforced core buildup that I created. And what did, what did this look like? On, you know, this is right after I, I, I finished my, I delivered my restoration. I took this bite wing and I want you to look at that core 
And I want you to look at the amount of dentin that was removed from the previous dentist that was removed when they did the first root canal. You can see how thin these walls are. And now you understand why you need to reinforce, why we needed to do the wallpaper technique to reinforce that tooth and to reinforce this core. And you can see also that I have my core and that I have my final restoration, that lithium disilicate. This is a Lisi press restoration delivered uh, um, uh, to, for this case. And you can see, you know, a little bit of a margin elevation on the mesial and the distal, but everything looks nice and solid. Everything is, is, is one piece. You can see how thin this restoration is, maybe a millimeter and a half to two millimeters. If something were to fail here, most likely it's going to be the restoration. And I want to try to keep that tooth. This is a very young patient, you know, in her 30s. We want to keep that tooth there. We want to keep it bonded and we want this to stay bonded. And I, and I know that we've given this our best to keep it, you know, to keep the, to make this bond between the core and the tooth very strong and also between the, the restoration and the actual core buildup. But again, our fail safe zone is down here, is all where all these fibers are. And I just want, this x-ray just tells you a little bit about, you know, what were the conditions of this tooth before I went ahead and moved forward with this final restoration. And this was our final photo. I really thank everybody for watching. I hope that this information, like every other video that we have on our YouTube channel, is helpful for you from a clinical standpoint. If you have any questions or comments, please make sure that you write, our, you write the comments in our comment box. And please share these videos with your friends and colleagues so that they can also benefit from all this great free information that we have in our YouTube channel. Have a good rest of your day.